Part two. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, obviously, I've got a lot to say about this book. The, the camera I'm using has a 30 minute timer. It auto automatically shuts itself off after 30 minutes. So whenever I make longer videos, I have to upload them in multiple parts. Anyways, uh, I think what I was saying right before the camera shut off last time is the way uh, Eurocentric history has traditionally been done is there, there is this kind of framework about intellectual progression with, uh, you know, from the Romans and then the Dark Ages and then the Enlightenment and then the French Revolution. Uh, and, and there's this kind of progression of ideas that's probably an oversimplification, but it does make it easier to create a narrative, especially an ideological narrative about, about the history of progressive politics in the, in the world. Uh, that gets broken up a little bit when you have to kind of check over what's happening in Africa and check over what's happening in China. But that's, that's unavoidable. Uh, nowadays, you can't write a history of the world and have it only be about Europe anymore. You, you, do have to, you do have to include the rest of the world and that's all for the better, really. Um, but it does, yeah, it does seem to be breaking up Chris Harmon's story, where he's like, all right, let's go over and see what's happening over in China for a chapter now. And it doesn't help that he doesn't really have anything interesting to say about what's happening in China or what's happening in Africa. I mean, fair enough, because he doesn't really have anything interesting to say about what's happening in Europe before he gets to the French Revolution. Um, but all really he has to talk about is these big empires that are rising and falling and you know there's no interesting names of interesting people uh it's just all big faceless empires and faceless masses that are being oppressed by them also he's he, he does have this agenda where he's really worried that the audience for this book is going to think that Chinese civilization or African civilization is somehow inferior to European civilization. Um, so he's constantly going on about, okay, actually China was much more advanced than Europe in this period. Uh, or every now and again, China, we get into a historical period where China wasn't more advanced than Europe. So he'll say, okay, actually in this period, China wasn't more advanced than Europe, but wasn't really China's fault. They've had all these other historical stuff going on, so you can't really judge them for it. And, and this seems to be a theme he's harping on over and over and over again. And I, I just wanted to be like, yeah, I, I get it. I get it. There's nothing inferior about the Chinese. Uh, Asia is, you know, Asian people are just as intelligent as European people. I, I mean, it, it just seems a little bit patronizing in this day and age. Although I, well, I guess in this day and age, you, you really can never tell, huh? Uh, all the crazies that are coming out of the woodwork nowadays. Um, but at the time I read it, uh, I was just thinking, yeah, we, we get it. Every, everybody knows that Chinese civilization was not inferior to European civilization. And if they, if they didn't know it the first time, th then you could just tell them once. You, you didn't need to be harping on this over and over again. I just, I just found it patronizing and I found it boring. But then he, he completely drops the ball uh, at some points. Uh, he's been criticized. I've, I've seen this in other reviews online. People have criticized him for spending a lot of time on the Russian Revolution and not really spending a lot of time on the Chinese Revolution, uh, Communist Revolution. Uh, and of course, uh, the Russian Revolution is the one that everyone talks about, but China is where the majority of the world's population is. So in terms of things that affect the majority of the world's population. Sorry, it's, it's not really a majority, is it? It's more like a plurality or something. But there's a lot of people in China, is what I'm getting at. Uh, so it, it, it might be worth spending more time on because it, it affects such a huge amount of people, the one in China. Of course, as a Trotskyist, he's probably a little bit reluctant to, to spend too much time on Maoism because it doesn't fit his narrative. I don't know if that's what's going on there. But, but then the other thing is, uh, I, you know, I, I mentioned how this book has a much more bias towards recent history than ancient history. So he doesn't spend any time at all on ancient Roman Greece, but he spends a whole 10 pages on 1968, which is a lot of pages to spend when you only have like 600 pages on all of world history. Right, so he, he spends 10 pages on 1968. Uh, 
does not get to Asia once. Uh, he only talks about Europe and America. Well, he includes Mexico in there. So I, I don't know if Mexico counts as... Mexico is still kind of North America, isn't it? So he only talks about Europe and North America. Um, now, there were a lot of interesting stuff going on in Asia in 1968. There was a cultural revolution in China, which, okay, that was a little bit strange. Maybe you don't want to count that. But there were big student protests in South Korea and in Japan. And in fact, um, arguably, the student protest movement started off uh, in South Korea and Japan. There were, there were big student protests going on in South Korea and Japan in the early 60s when Europe and America was relatively quiet. Um, and, and uh, you know, this, this had an influence. People forget this nowadays, but it had an influence. It, these things, this was one of the reasons that the student protests spread uh, to Europe and America was because of what was happening on in South Korea and Japan. He, he doesn't mention any of this. He doesn't mention anything that's going in Asia. Even when he's listing cities, like he has a section where he lists all the cities where major demonstrations took place in 1968, it doesn't even like fit Tokyo into his list. It, 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 it just completely drops the ball on this completely. Um, so, yeah. And, and when I... When I didn't want him to talk about Asia, he, he was going on and talking about Asia and it was really boring. When he should have been talking about Asia, when there was interesting stuff going on there, like, like uh, the student protest movements uh, in South Korea and Japan or the Chinese Revolution, then he completely dropped the ball on that. Okay, so that's my long list of complaints. Now, there were actually some things I liked about this book, so I'll finish off the review by talking about some of the things I liked. Excuse me. Um, the first few chapters of this book are excellent. So Harmon talks about the beginning of human history. Now the beginning of human history is not recorded necessarily, but he uses archaeological studies and he uses uh, data from modern anthropological studies of uh, uh, human civilizations that are still living in tribes. Uh, to show that the natural state of human beings is not to live in a warlike, hierarchical society. Uh, for 95% of human history, 95% of it, we were organized into egalitarian hunter-gatherer tribes. There was no organized warfare, there was no class repression. So, you know, when you hear people talking about, well, capitalism, I don't like capitalism, but it's natural. It is not natural. It was not natural for 95% of human history. Organized warfare was not natural for 95% of human history. I mean, you couldn't even have organized warfare unless you had organized governments. Uh, you could have violence, but you couldn't have organized warfare. The, the other thing I thought was really insightful about this is he's taking an economic view of the rise and fall of civilizations. So, like, if your schooling was anything like mine, you would, I, I mean, I remember in history classes, and granted I went to a conservative school, but, you know, I, I would hear about how Rome fell because the people became decadent. Or, you know, how the Spanish Empire fell because the, they, they became immoral. Uh, and he says that, really, the morals or religions have nothing to do with it. It was all about the overuse of resources. So the resources was, were created by the lower class and they were used up by the wealthier classes. And if the wealthier classes got too greedy and if they started consuming too much resources that the lower classes couldn't produce anymore, then that's why the civilization fell. It had nothing to do with religion or decadence or morals or anything like that that you normally hear in history class. I thought that was really interesting. Now, I'm not quite sure what he would say about this modern age, because he does talk about the Marxist theory of overproduction, which if you're not familiar with, I'll, I'll do my best to explain this briefly. Somebody correct me in the comments if I'm getting this wrong, but I, I believe uh, Marx had this theory that because of capitalism and because of these factories and because, you know, things are getting mass produced in the assembly line, for the first time in history, we no longer have a problem of uh, the upper classes taking up all the surplus wealth and none being left. 
What we have now is a problem of overproduction. So there's so much stuff coming up of the factory lines uh, that there's nobody to buy it anymore. You, you know, there, there's like, uh, they're making shoes, right? And they're char the, the workers are only getting paid a fraction of the value of the la labor meaning made to create these shoes. They create these shoes, they want to sell them all at inflated, inflated prices, but who's going to buy them? Because all the workers are getting paid so little that they can't actually buy the products they're creating. So you, you have this crisis of overproduction, um, which is, is different than previous historical crises. So I don't think, I don't know, I don't, I don't think Chris Harmon is going to say that this is a crisis facing the modern age because of his Marxist analysis uh, of history. And yet, it does strike me that maybe this is the crisis facing the modern age, at least maybe in an ecological or an environmental sense, where we are just using up all these natural resources. And, you know, there's a finite amount. Oil is going to be gone pretty quickly. Uh, but, I mean, forget about that. The problem is not that the oil is going to run out. The problem is that all this carbon produced by the, all this overuse of resources. Uh, so that, it did strike me while I was reading that, that this could be the, the next big collapse that, that we're coming across now. Uh, speaking of which, Harman does a good job of showing how the stability of the modern age is a dangerous illusion. So he, he goes through this book and he, he demonstrates that in every period of history, the ruling classes believed that they were at the end of history, that nothing big was going to change, that it was just totally stable from here on out, and the people who are in control now are the people who are always going to be in control. And then the civilization collapses, right? Uh, which has happened repeatedly again and again throughout history. So he says, you know, don't, don't be complacent. Don't think that uh, the people who are in control now are safe. Uh, things will collapse. I mean, in five years or 500 years, it's difficult to say, but the, the stability of the modern age is an illusion. Um, also, World War II, I thought his section on World War II was excellent. He, he did a great job of cutting through all the mythology about, you know, this was the good war. It shows how that the Allies were not interested in spreading democracy. They were just interested in protecting their colonial interests. You know, Winston Churchill was interested in protecting the British colonies. He was not interested in, in spreading democracy or, or values or anything like that. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I thought that section was very well done. Uh, also, uh, I, I've been complaining all along about how I didn't think this book did a good job on the history before the French Revolution, but I do have to admit that there were some interesting sections on this. The section on the English Civil War uh, was, was interesting, uh, and especially the levelers and the diggers. I, I didn't know anything about the levelers and the diggers beforehand. This was the book that... Uh, that turned me on to them. Uh, and since reading this book, I've gone and done a lot of research and read a couple different books on the leveler movement. And I guess I have Chris Harmon to thank for that because I never would have heard of the levelers. Well, I probably would have heard of them eventually. I don't know. Maybe not. I, I, I heard of the levelers because of Chris Harmon. Uh, same with the, the diggers movement. Uh, same with the, the peasants rebellion in, in Germany. Uh, in the 14th century, uh, 15th century was it, um, and it, his, his analysis on that was brief, but it was interesting for what it was. So it, it wasn't a total waste of time. I did learn some interesting things about it. Final verdict. There were definitely things I liked about this book. I don't think I can recommend it. I think the negatives outweigh the positives, but there were definitely some things I liked about it. I don't know. Uh, let me know what you think if you've read it.